Welcome everyone to Deep Dive MH370, Episode 4, The Reboot. This is Andy Tarnoff along with Jeff Wise. I'm the publisher of On Milwaukee, and Jeff is an aviation journalist and expert on MH370. Let's do well, this again, Jeff. Yeah, episode four. I'm ready for it. You know, we're really getting into the good stuff now. You know, something I say again and again is that it's not really a mystery you can even really talk about or think about until you know the essence of the technical details. And that's what we're going to start getting into today. We're going to talk about the stuff that a lot of people, even people who write books or documentaries, like don't know this stuff. And it's really the foundation upon which everything else is built. And so you're going to really start to understand what we're talking about after today. We're going to get into it. In the next couple episodes, we're going to really sort of build the, the, the rubrics cube of... That's not the rubrics called. cube, rubrics I like cube. that. But it's a bad, it's a bad metaphor because that's not how it works. Leave that aside. Leave that aside. The point is, this is the kind of the skeletal structure upon which everything else will hang. Okay. This is the episode that I have been, have been the most excited about because right? it is by far the most technical and complicated but we're going to make it not that complicated. No. It's something, something, we're, we're about to talk about some crazy stuff here. We're going to split it up into three episodes. This is, we're going to, we're going to talk about stuff called the SDU data, and it is a little bit heavy lifting for one episode. So we're going to make it easy. We're going to split it up into three bunny slopes instead of having one triple diamond slope. Okay. All right. Well, in last week's episode, uh, right. Deep Dive MH370, we talked about how the plane had disappeared off air traffic control screens. And then it was found to turn back 180 degrees and fly northwest, and at least in my direction. Right. That's northwest. And, and then at 1822 Universal Time, one final blip appeared on the military radar over Malaysia. Right. Then the plane flew out of range, and poof, it disappeared. It had completely disappeared. It had completely disappeared. It was the middle of the night. It was out over the open ocean. Nobody could see it. Nobody knew where it was electronically. It was out of everyone's primary radar. It wasn't transmitting any of the signals that, it would, that would allow air traffic controllers to see it on their secondary radar. All the different ways and means that airplanes have in this modern age to stay in contact with everyone else, it had all been turned off. This plane, which if somebody was trying to steal this plane, they had at this point completely succeeded. They could go anywhere in the world that they wanted to, and nobody would know because they had gotten away scot free. Yeah, you said it was so like a, you said it was like a end. prisoner who is who, who's getting away from bloodhounds when they're crossing a river. I love I like that yeah, analogy. Yeah, no, exactly. Because it's That's disappeared. It's disappeared twice now, but it's going to disappear now some more. Disappeared twice. Well, okay. So this is the end of our show. Yeah, we're we said over. Everything there is we're to done. say about MH370 because it's gone. The plane has disappeared. It's now vanished. There's nothing else to say about MH370. The whole mystery is over. The plane vanished into the night. End of story. Full stop. Period. Close the book. Put it back on the shelf. There's nothing else to say. But, well, but no, actually, exactly. But no. But <laughs> wait, as they used to say in the uh, late night infomercials. But wait, there's more because. 1822, last radar blip. Three minutes later, 1825, when now we're talking 2.25 a.m. local time, something happens. And for, for a long time after the plane disappears, nobody knows that this thing has happened. So we're all in the dark. And then, you know, because remember back in the day, back in mid-March 2014, when all this is happening, I'm going on CNN every day, and all the journalists for the world are thinking of nothing else except MH370. And then there's a press conference. Yeah, that's on March 15th, right? It's uh, the Malaysian it's Prime March Minister, 15th. Najib Razak, and he holds this press conference, right. and he has a stunning announcement. Today, based on raw satellite data, which was obtained from the satellite data service provider, we can confirm that the aircraft shown in the primary radar data was flight MH370. This is one week after the plane has disappeared. And remember, at first they were looking for it in the South China Sea, then they were looking for it to the northwest uh, in the area of the Andaman Sea. And now this guy stands up and he makes an incredible pronouncement. He says, we have now just gotten satellite data 
from this company called Inmarsat. And they are saying that this plane was sending signals that they recorded for another six hours. This plane was flying for another six hours. Now remember, when the plane initially disappeared, they assumed that it just crashed at the place where they had the last signal, because that's usually what planes do. And then they found out that it went to the Northwest because they saw it in primary radar, and they assumed it crashed there, so they were looking there. Now, they know that both of these places are wrong. This plane was flying for another six hours. These planes fly like almost 500 miles an hour. So you're talking nearly 3,000 miles it could have gone anywhere in any direction. So now you're looking at like basically all of Asia and all of the Indian Ocean. It could be anywhere. Yeah, it's like a it third like of the globe. East I mean, this, is, this is a huge amount of space. If you plot the where people live in the globe, like half of humanity is living where this plane could have gone. Right. So it could have been anywhere. And yet, so it's a vast it. area. Right. So this is a huge shock so before we huge shock. jeff before we get into the inmarsat stuff let's yeah. let's just clear out some of these possible scenarios that most most people were thinking and obviously you were thinking it the authorities were thinking it but they've been ruled out you know so i mean the first thing i thought of in 2014 was this was some sort of ghost plane there was a depression pressurization it was like you know Payne stewart's plane just flying on autopilot until it eventually crashed right but that right could not have happened well, there's a lot of reasons to think it didn't happen because what sometimes happens when a plane depressurizes, it becomes like a ghost plane. It's flying along just on autopilot and all the, the pilots are dead. Basically, it will just follow whatever path has been programmed into it. We actually had a case like this really similar to this this summer where a, a Citation jet, a, a private jet, had taken off. Uh, it was flying up towards Long Island from the south, and then it it it, it was was programmed to kind of enter the the descent path for this airport on Long Island. But the pilot had had died. We don't know really know why. And the plane kind of looped around and headed back the way it came, much in the way that MA three seventy looped around and, and went back the way it came. But it kept going in a straight line. What MA370 did was it turned around, but then it like made several different turns, at least two significant turns. So that's not really something that's consistent with a plane that is flying in a kind of a ghost plane configuration. Although people have written whole books saying that they think this. It's happened. not just not a little consistent. That's not how autopilots work. They don't make sharp turns and do stuff like that. I mean, you can sort of always come up with stopgap explanations for why you're okay. crazy. Um, and in this case, the person says that, well, they were mostly unconscious, but not entirely unconscious. You can be in this kind of semi-conscious, like, like sleepwalking state where like you can make inputs into the plane, but you're not like awake enough to really do something effective, like descend. Um, the, but but the, my, I guess my main problem is if you're at least even semi-conscious, the first thing that pilots would do is put on their oxygen mask and descend. And both of those, either of those things would have prevented a ghost flight scenario. Right. These are trained pilots. Um, the pilots specifically had a ton of hours. Uh, the co-pilot was a little bit newer, but, you know, he wasn't just, you know, he wasn't yeah. just winging it out there. So if he would have been in some sort of mayday situation, he wouldn't have just been kind of, you know, s steering around in circles, one would think. Presumably not. I mean, we we have, we're not up there, so we don't. There's always know. this. There's you. It's hard to say impossible, and I don't like to say impossible. I mean, I, I and, and this is, I think, a really important point is that science isn't about saying who's right and who's wrong. Although it tends to get simpler, simplified in that way, it's about speaking about probabilities. Like, what's the most likely thing to have happened? And I think as new pieces of data come in, you. In, and, and everyone is entitled to their own judgment. It's, this, it's very much a judgment call. But as new data comes in, some things seem less and less and less likely, and some things seem more and more likely. And I think, and I hope that as our listeners come along with us on this journey, and as we introduce new pieces of information and try to talk about what these pieces of information mean, we will be revising our judgment as we go as to what the different possibilities are. So I don't, so, so the ghost flight scenario, I would say, is has some major strikes against it. And I would almost in sort of casual conversation, maybe use the impossible word. 
but it's really not impossible. And we don't want to sh- we don't want to shut things down prematurely. But there are things that are like truly, I would say, impossible. Um, and I think I want to talk about this at the end of the show. Something that's truly impossible. Well, I think, but I'm going to save that for now. I think if anyone has, if they're listening or watching now, they've probably watched and listened to episode one and two. But we spent the entire first episode talking about how this isn't a conspiracy theory podcast. You know, this is science right. and this is following data. So it's good to admit that there's a possibility that we don't know every single detail yeah. we're, we're using the scientific method and investigative journalism to put it together. So while, yes, you could say casually it's impossible. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but the data that we're about to talk about, the information we're about to talk about would lead someone to think that the plane was probably not a ghost plane. And that's where the in Marset stuff comes in. So I, yeah. I think we should dive right into that if you do. Okay. So let's see. So what is this data? What we, we none none of us had any idea. We, we were all completely shocked. I'm time traveling back to March 15th, 2014. What is this data? What are we even talking about? Hello, what's going on? So Inmarsat is a company that's based in London and what they do is they provide satellite communication services primarily to airplanes and ships. So when a ship or an airplane is, you know, um, in the middle of the ocean, it's far from land. It's impossible to send a radio signal, say, from the middle of the Atlantic to New York or London or wherever you're trying to go. So the way that you overcome that is to send a signal up to a satellite that you can see because it's hovering in a stationary orbit over a certain point of land. So you're in a ship, and you're and so if you're on a ship or a plane that's that's in the middle of the ocean. Um, you will be able to have a line of sight, meaning you can look up overhead and see the satellite just sort of hanging in the sky. It's in a geosynchronous orbit, meaning it goes once around the Earth per day. So it's always over the same spot over the Earth. And Inmarsat has a constellation of these satellites that are spread out around the globe. So no matter where you are, as long as you're sort of not exactly near the poles, you can have a good line of sight to these satellites and you can communicate to anywhere else in the world. And pin this because we are going to get extremely detailed on satellite technology and geosynchronous (laughs) orbit. And it was one of the things that it it was like a light bulb moment when we met up in New York and Mm -hmm. started talking about some of the finer points because it is in your book, but it is, it's confusing, but we're going to do our best to make this make sense. Would now be a good time to talk about the service that Malaysia Airlines subscribed to and the one that they didn't subscribe to? Right. So I think it's important to understand that Malaysia Airlines at this time, as for much of its history, was in dire financial straits. They had it was not a well-run company. It was kind of like a state airline. And there was a lot of pride amongst Malaysians that this was their flag carrier. And they had some very nice airplanes. This particular 777 that MA370 was, was a pretty nice plane. It was relatively new. They were having financial problems, so they tended to cut corners where they could. And one of the ways that they cut corners is that when they subscribed to the satellite communication service, they didn't get the most expensive one. They got the cheapest one. And and this will this will come to this will become important later. Right. Because had they sprung for the the, kind of service that they had, had they sprung for the fancier one, there might be less of a mystery right now because the one that they all mystery would not. have. Yeah. The one they had did not relay altitude, direction, speed a whole lot of anything, right? It was pretty much like, I'm here. Right. So I think what's important to understand is that the, is let's talk a little bit about how this service worked. Okay. So this was a bit like a cell service, right? You have this device on board the plane, which has an antenna and then it has a box under it called the satellite data unit or the SDU. This is going to become very important very soon. The satellite data unit is the box that takes uh, signals from elsewhere in the plane and and, uh, sort of translates it into an electronic form that it can shoot up through the antenna up into the sky, up to the satellite, which then relays it back to Earth. And then in Marsat, we'll forward it to whoever it needs to forward it to. So I know the answer to this. Yeah, I know the answer to this, but I'm going to lead you into this this answer anywhere. Where is the (laughs) SDU located on the plane? So the SDU is located on the back 
Um, think of like a shark's dorsal fin. It's somewhere around there, sort of back uh, uh, on the top of the plane towards the rear, um, sort of midway towards the rear. And so it's up there. It's up sort of pointing at the sky. This makes sense. And uh, like I said, it's like a, yeah, it makes sense, right? And so it's it, it, as the plane turns this way and that, um, the you know, it might turn a little bit away from the sky, but this part of the plane can always see the sky, unless it's flying upside down, which passenger planes really try hard not to do. So it's pointing at the sky and it's acting like a, think of it as a cell phone almost. So your cell phone that's in your pocket right now, even though you're not using it, you're not sending a text, you're not talking to somebody, but it's every once in a while, it sends a signal to the nearest cell phone tower. So it's ready to carry the, that message when it's ready to, when you want it to. And so this box, this SDU, the satellite data unit is also sending periodical pings, electronic little chirps up to the satellite to say once in a while, I'm here. This should not be a concept now, that's, that's it's not that foreign to people who understand how cell phones work. I used to work in the cell phone industry yeah. and, the, and they do it through triangulation yeah. between towers. Uh, the difference here is it's shooting it up straight to a satellite and it's bringing back information. Right, and from a lot of places on Earth, you can see different satellites. In fact, and there's one over the Pacific, there's one over the Indian Ocean, and there's one over the Atlantic, and so there's various ones that, so oftentimes the, the SDE will have to make a decision which one, it's almost like handing off a cell phone to a different tower. So in this case, the entire flight is under the Indian Ocean region satellite the, of Inmarsat's constellation. When it was, when, it, if the plane had continued on its planned flight to Beijing, it would have switched over midway to the Pacific, but that never happened. And that's an important clue, actually. So for six hours, it continued in right. its waiting mode, sending these hourly pings as scheduled. But the Inmarsat yes. scientists at that point didn't really know what to do with that information until. We, well, don't forget at this time in, in mid-March of 2014, we didn't know any of this. All we knew was that the satellite company said that they had had communication with the plane. And we didn't know what this, what the data consisted of or what it indicated or anything like that. But we did know that this mystery had now taken on a completely different character. And I would say this is where MH370, which had started out weird to me, as you'll remember, the timing of its disappearance from the air traffic control screens to me seemed very uncanny. And then it seemed very weird that the plane had turned back. Now the fact that it had flown for six hours, there has never been anything remotely like this in any kind of aircraft accident investigation. And very specifically, the every other communication system within the plane had been turned off. And yet this SDU right. continued to broadcast for six hours. Why was this one still operating? That's a great, that's a great point. So in the, so, so I talked to some of my pilot friends at the time and I said, you know, um, how do you, you know, if, if everything was turned off, how do you turn this thing on? And all of my friends who fly triple sevens were like, I have no idea what this box even is. I've never heard of it. I have no idea how to turn it off or on. And so a safe assumption at that time was that well, if pilots don't know how to turn this off, then it probably, they probably just didn't know about it. And the pilot was probably trying to be sneaky or whoever could it might've been somebody whomever. else, maybe other, some kind of super sophisticated, whomever. They had just didn't know that this system existed. And so when they turned everything else off, they didn't know to turn this one off too. So it was a bit of an oversight on their part. That's what we thought in mid-March. That was a reasonable assumption. In fact, the only really plausible assumption to make at that point. However, like many things with MH370, it turned out to be wrong. You have to be very careful about the assumptions that you make. So I think, again, to talk about how we want to approach this mystery in this podcast, we want to look very carefully at what assumptions we're making. And we are going to look so carefully that we're not even going to talk about any more of this during this episode, because it would be a very, very, very long episode, because there's lots of SDU things to discuss. It's a lot of clues. This was basically the main clue for the entire mystery. So that's why we want to be so careful with it. Instead, that. what we're going to do is what we've been talking about doing now for three weeks, four weeks. And we're going to take 
a listener question. You ready? Well, well, actually, I want to preempt you there, Andy. Okay. I know that we had a plan. All right, let's cut it. <laughs> but I've been so no, I no. Let's keep going. Okay. I mean, it's it's fine. It's okay. fine. It's okay. But circumstances have overtaken me. What happened is everybody is. is this, oh, I wanted to do one listener question, but I just I've been inundated with the same question. Tell me. <laughs> and it's been kind of burning a hole in my pocket. Okay. So there is this footage that's circulating on the internet. And I even just had a TV producer reach out to me about it, saying, have you seen this footage? What do you think? And it shows, apparently, UFOs circling around MH370 and causing it to vanish in a blip. And... People are taking this. We talked about this a little bit last week and discounted it immediately. Is there some new development since we talked about this last? Yeah, well, I I think we actually have to deal with it more seriously. All right, fine, fine. Talk to me about UFOs. This thing is taking us seriously. Fine, fine. So this, I want to talk about what this looks like. It looks, people are talking about, oh, it was the satellite footage that was taken in March of 2014. And it's from such and such a satellite. It's taken to such and such a band of infrared or something. They talk very pseudoscientific. It sounds very technical. And what they are described, then you look at the video and it's like, it doesn't look like it's from a satellite. When you see things from a satellite, you're looking basically straight down. And this is from like the side. It looks like it's taken from another aircraft or something. But here's the important... Here's the really important thing to know about this footage. If you look at this footage, it shows MH370 disappearing while surrounded by UFOs. I don't even want to say that the idea that MH370 was was absconded uh, with by UFOs was considered ri- so ridiculous at the time that the plane disappeared that like people were laughed out of the studio I would at, think so, yeah. at the time, right? It's like a, it's kind of a ridiculous idea on its face. And the fact that we're taking it, that I even have to go into this level of detail now, kind of shows how our civilization has eroded in the last nine and a half years. However, I do want to say one, there's one really important take home from this video, which is that if all you know about MA370 is that it disappeared, this video kind of makes sense. But as I think Andy and I have taken great pains to explain, MA370 didn't disappear once. It didn't just vanish into a blip with UFOs. It disappeared three times. Well, maybe the UFOs more. brought it back, Jeff. I mean, um, maybe they just borrowed it for a little while and maybe moved it. They weren't finished with it. But I think this is a really key. Po- I really, I think this is a really key point to understand, is that the, the, most people, I think, have such a grazing level of understanding about what happened to MH370 that they don't even understand that it isn't the plane that disappeared. It's the plane that disappeared four times, or maybe five times, depending on how you count. And so it doesn't really, it doesn't explain anything to say that the UFOs just made it blip. If they made it blip, well, then how come it was still transponding, uh, sending these satellite signals six hours yeah. later? I'm sorry if I look you know bored on all this UFO so talk, it, but if it, if it turns out that it is the UFOs, then yeah. then we should probably stop the podcast because we're way off. <laughs> I think I think we just have to just ex- oh, the, the I mean, series. So I think we have to, to put it aside, don't you? There's so many things that if it happens, I will have to eat my hat so many times. And, and I hope to talk. I mean, we, we've already spent a lot of time this, this episode talking about ghost plane. I mean, if it turns out it was a ghost plane, there's so many things that I, I don't think poo pooing things is, is um, bad. I, wanna, I mean, I think that some of this stuff is just, you know, totally bananas. And um, um, I wanted to talk about this episode, even if we did touch on it in an earlier episode, because. I, you know, I think it is important to, to, to talk about how we talk about MH370. And I, I, I said the ghost plane scenario is not impossible, but low, low probability. I think three UFOs circling around a plane until it goes pop, that's, that is impossible. I think that is like the moon is made out of blue cheese. I think it does not really deserve consideration. And frankly, the fact that... I have TV producers reaching out to me and saying, what do you think about this footage makes me think that all of my efforts over the last nine and a half years have been in vain. Because well, like just from nothing a, is sinking you know, in. From a media like, perspective, nothing I've been you humoring those guys and going on and talking about UFOs, that doesn't help your credibility as you prove through this podcast, through your book, through the articles you've written, through the documentary. You're not just taking shots in the dark on, on crazy conspiracy theories. 
So I agree with you. I think that right. it discredits the all the science that went into this. That's why it's kind of like meh. But I, you know, and but a good thing to to take from all this is that this also made me think. Well, I'm glad I'm doing this podcast now with with Andy because. We are shooting this now, I think, about a week and a half before we're going to go live with this. And and it's allowing us to respond to things that are happening in real time. And as we said, I think, last episode, this is a live case. This case, this is not a cold case. This is a case that's continuing You're to right. happen. You're right. And that's, that's actually really encouraging because we're not just talking about um, events that were 10 years ago and then ended. I mean, even, even the fact that someone's still talking about MH370, whether it be UFOs or otherwise, and... You know, it allows this conversation to continue. And it shows evolve. the hold that it has on yeah. the imagination. But so now that brings us into this reader question, if I may, because. Oh, okay, we're gonna do another reader question. Well, that wasn't the reader question. That was. I don't think it was anyway. Okay. All right, the reader okay. question. Okay. 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 Comes. <laughs> this is someone who watched the Netflix documentary, and I think it's reasonable that a lot of people who are listening to this and watching this have seen the Netflix documentary, and. They want to know about the Tom Knott woman that was featured very prominently in the documentary who said that she found the satellite pictures of the, the plane and then it was just discarded. And it really came off in the documentary like uh, the authorities weren't taking that project seriously. But as we've talked about it, that, that was maybe portrayed a little differently in the documentary than how it happened in real life. Yeah, exactly. So this is a good reader question, listener question, I should say. This is something that I was inundated with this question after the show aired. Everyone wanted to know, why didn't you take this woman seriously? Because she seemed absolutely convinced that she had found the plane. So why couldn't she get anyone to pay attention to her? And I think the context that was missing in the TV show was that there wasn't one woman from Tom Nod saying that, that she'd found the plane. There was like a thousand people from Tom Nod. Because Tom Nad had, had taken the satellite data and split it up into bits and, and offered it up for free to anyone who vo wanted to volunteer to look through it in an attempt to crowdsource the, the, to find out where this plane was. And all of these people were given shots of the Earth taken from space, and they were pictures of things like clouds and pieces of garbage floating in the ocean and like wave tops and all these like sort of smudgy white things. Any one, of, any one of which, if you looked at it and you squinted and you were kind of motivated to see what you wanted to see, looked like a piece of the plane, you know, the nose or the tail or, a, or an engine cowling or whatever. And so at the time when we were trying to, as you know, a whole bunch of people were collectively trying to work together um, on the Internet to try to figure out where this plane had gone, we were just absolutely tsunamied with people from Tom Nod saying, I found it, I found it, look at this picture. And it was always like waves or something, just a blob. And they were like, look, and they would draw like little dotted lines to show you where the shape of the plane was. And, the, and it was just amazing study in human psychology where people would become absolutely convinced that this absolutely ambiguous data was certainly their proof positive that they had discovered this plane. And everyone was sort of one little image away from being the famous, the person who found Including Courtney plane. Love. And Do you know about that? I, yeah, I do. Rem I vaguely do remember Courtney. She, was, she thought she found something yeah. too. But you know, honestly, I don't think that uh, that concept is flawed. Even if there was an overwhelming flow of information, but the documentary made it a little confusing because it's ignoring the fact that the plane showed up not in that place. So I feel like in the documentary, it was given sort of an un. An un, un, unbalanced amount of importance uh, to something that scientifically was proven didn't happen. If you are willing to ignore all the evidence, or just take one, this is called cherry picking evidence in science, right? If you if you are if you're allowed to choose the evidence that you are going to base your your conclusion on, you can reach any conclusion. And so it's a dead end. It's it's worse than a dead end. It leads you astray. And so it's really important to, at, at sort of square one, to identify what all the evidence is and then understand it and then try to find the scenarios that can account for every piece of evidence. You don't have to account for every piece of evidence. Probably most theories won't because some of that evidence is actually going to turn out later to be wrong. But, you, but, but it's like a horse race to see which 
hypothesis can best explain, most parsimoniously explain the most evidence. And again, it doesn't tell you the right answer, but you get a sort of sense of what's more probable and what's less probable. And unfortunately, the Tomnod woman was operating in a complete informational vacuum, and she was actually looking at data that came from a piece of the ocean that we knew the plane wasn't. Because the plane had been flying for six hours, it, hadn't, it wasn't near where it was initially disappeared. So that's actually century. what we're going to get into into the next episode. And we're going to talk a whole lot about SDUs and radar pings and charting where this plane could have gone. I, the, this is going to get really detailed, and I'm really excited about it. Maybe you could preview it just for a quick minute to, to let people know what's coming. Yeah, so what we're going to talk about next is what this data told us. Because the mere fact that the data existed told us something, but to get a better idea of where the plane had gone and what might have happened to it, we had to kind of pick apart this data. And as we said, this, the, the airline had bought the budget version, and so it didn't have as much data as we could have liked to have that would have told us exactly where the plane was. So we had to use some fancy mathematical footwork to kind of deduce where it had gone. And so that's why we're going to need to take a little bit of time to slowly unpack it and just make it very, very easy. To I'm pretty understand. excited for that one. It's, it's going to get nerdy. But we're gonna make <laughs> not it. Too we're gonna <laughs> not too nerdy. I would never nerd out. Too there could be maps. Never a fatal. It's gonna be level. animation. It's gonna be like it's gonna be like it's gonna be like one chili pepper on the nerd the, uh, scale. The okay. Menu. All right. Well, that's a good place yeah. to leave episode four. One slide. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. episode four, the reboot, and episode five. I don't know what we're calling that one yet, but that'll be coming at you next Thursday. We got we got a week to think about it. Ping rings. Ping rings. Thank you. Thought of it on the fly. <laughs> Meantime, Jeff, uh, let's 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 keep working on this. Let's take the readers' calls, uh, readers' uh, messages. Uh, people who are watching this on YouTube or listening to it on Apple Podcasts should be liking, subscribing, leaving comments, leaving yeah. ratings. Give us a review. Let us know what you're thinking. It it helps us make a better show, and it also boosts our like the well, algorithm. Yeah, the algorithm, please. Do Which we're already we're already up there, you know. By the way. So we're doing some we're doing something right. Awesome. Okay. I'll see you next week. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Andy. Bye-bye.